let's move to the reason for uh, John Dunn Scooter's beatification and, you know, the area where people are most likely to be uh, sympathetic with him, obviously. Um his his thought on the incarnation and the immaculate conception. So his position, as I understand it, is that the incarnation would have happened even if we hadn't sinned, as opposed to the idea that the incarnation is um, the result, so to speak, of the fall of man. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And uh, this, the theological reason for that is that God, on Scotus's view, as on everyone else's view, it, God is a perfect lover. So he always loves things um, in a, an orderly way. So he always loves himself most of all. It would be unseemly, unfitting for God not to love <clears throat> him, himself most of all. So God so to speak, if we can imagine a kind of planning out phase of creation um, on God's part, even though, you know, it doesn't really happen in a temporal sequence, but, you know, the sort of logical right. ordering in God's mind would be that when he uh, chooses to create, he creates primarily for his own sake and secondarily mm -hmm. for the sake of angels or human beings or so on and so forth. And so what Scotus recognized is that if the primary reason for the incarnation is to fix the human sin problem and restore humanity to its, you know, so to speak, to the original plan before the fall of Adam, mm -hmm. then this amazing event in the history of the cosmos, God becoming incarnate, is uh, an afterthought or a solution to a problem rather than mm -hmm. what God wills for himself uh, primarily. So God primarily wills that, that hypostatic union with the human nature of Christ. Mm -hmm. That becomes the kind of um, the master key or the, uh, the, the stone that, you know, the, the foundation of the whole cosmic plan on Scotus's hmm. view, and everything else is planned in light of that fact. Um, and so fixing the sin problem still is an important part of Scotus's overall understanding of what Christ accomplishes uh, on earth. Obviously, he's a, he's a Christian theologian, but it's not for Scotus the primary reason why God became incarnate. Hmm. And so how does this all tie into the Immaculate Conception? Yeah, as um, as I'm sure you know, you know, Protestants who uh, object to Catholicism because of its Marian teachings will often say that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception detracts from the honor that we ought to give to Christ as the one Savior of all human beings, and that it, it, at first glance, the dogma seems to make Mary exempt from needing salvation in the first place, and so um, contradicts the Bible and dishonors Christ and so on. And of course, as Catholics, we know that that's not true, but it, it's nice to be able to give a response to Protestants who make those objections. And I myself was raised a Protestant, an evangelical Protestant, and uh, for some time of my adult life, the Marian dogmas uh, did give me pause. And so it's, uh, and most of my friends and family are still Protestant. And so it's on something that's on my heart and not just, you know, as part of my intellectual vocation to think well about, about, uh, about Mary. And what Scotus has to say is that to, to think of Mary as uh, immaculately conceived, in fact, gives greater honor to Christ than otherwise. And here's why he says that. There are several ways in which uh, a savior can save. I mean, if you imagine, um, uh, you know, someone falls off a cliff and then the person who goes and brings them back up off the cliff, that's a savior. <laughs> but someone could also be a savior by preventing someone from falling in the first place. You know, if you were 
going to fall, but then you were held back from falling. Well, that person is your savior. Yeah. And what Scotus says, and this is reflected in the language of the dogma, it's that it's by the merits of Christ that Mary was preserved free of original sin. The way in which Mary was saved, saved by preservation, is a singular way. Scotus thinks that there's, we have no reason to think that anyone else was saved in this way. But by being preserved, Mary was saved no less than any other human being was saved. And it's fitting that Christ would save some, at least one person in this way to demonstrate the whole range of his saving power. You know, if, we, if we think, well, it's like maybe if you climb down the cliff and get the person and bring them back up, that at, on the surface, that looks more impressive than if you just hold the person <laughs> to prevent her from falling in the first place. But, you know, that's just an analogy. If you think about the reality here, you know, it's Christ accrues these merits by his perfect life, his innocent suffering and so on. And he can uh, apply them in whatever way he likes. And part of what God is doing in Christ in the universe is you know, manifesting his awesomeness. And so to have examples, so to speak, of all the ways in which his salvation can be applied to humans is like a, a good way of showing his awesomeness. So that's all on the side of Christ, that uh, the, the teaching of the Immaculate Conception gives great honor to Christ. But of course, uh, it also gives great honor to Mary as the uh, uh, most honorable human being ever to live, as the one who said, uh, let it be to me according to your will, to the angel, um, accepted that cooperation with God to bring Christ into the world, and so is quite deserving of all of that honor, even though the, even though the way in which she is meritorious does not compel God to create her in an immaculate way. You know, that would be like, that would be basically a sort of Pelagian move that if we could have good enough behavior, then God would be obligated to take us to heaven. Like, no, that's not how the gospel works. Um, so even if Mary is totally free from sin, that doesn't obligate God to choose her as the one through whom he will enter the world as a baby. But still, even though there's no obligation here, we can recognize the fittingness of it. It's fitting for God to come to the world in a perfect human being. It's fitting for God to honor his mother in this way. Um, God is still free, but he is reasonable in his freedom. And so acts in this fitting way free from obligation. So both, so the dogma honors both Christ and Mary in these superlative ways. And Scotus, at the time uh, that Scotus defended the doctrine in roughly the way that I've been describing, it was a controversial view. Um, everyone thought that Mary was cleansed of original sin at the moment right after her conception. So she was conceived in original sin like we all are, but then out of um, the fittingness to have the uh, 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 pure receptacle for his incarnation and so on, the God cleansed her of that original sin. So she had it, you know, for like one millisecond. Huh. Okay. So all of the theologians at the time had got that far. Interesting. Um, and what Scotus did was give the, the extra little something needed for um, to, to make it make theological sense for Mary to be preserved altogether from sin. And that extra something was precisely that point I mentioned earlier about um, preventing someone from falling mm -hmm. is itself a way from a, a way of saving that person. Mm -hmm. And so that was Scotus's little innovation that uh, allowed him intellectually to defend the view. Now, it still was controversial, but he 
uh, you know, he he got the better of the argument in the end, as we all know. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing.